next talk is from Phil Pearson, who is over in Mountain View, California, who is going to be talking about the Postbox display adapter and an A3000, A5000 restoration. <laughs> over to you, Phil. All right, well, hello. Um, as uh, Daniel said, uh, today I'm going to be talking about some Archimedes series system repairs that I've done, most notably the somewhat obsessive repair of an extremely damaged A5000, but also uh, three A3000s, each of which had something interesting to teach me. Uh, all except one were interesting repairs, and by that I mean something other than the NVRAN clock chip needed fixing to get them to boot. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the newest debug tool in the Acorn Repairer's Arsenal, the post interface test box, which we're all calling the post box. Uh, Phil Pemberton was the first to realize that this debug system existed and to implement fresh hardware to connect to it and display the detailed soft test output. And I adapted this code, wrote some more, made a PCB, which lets you interface with the interactive side of the soft test protocol. Let's see access memory, exercise buses, do stuff like this on a machine which is otherwise horribly broken. Um, so, onto the slides. There we go. So, where does this all begin? Most interestingly, with the terrible A5000. I had an A4000 back when I was 12 years old, and at that time, the A5000 was king of the Acorn line. I, uh, I switched into the PC world right around when the Risk PC was appearing. So, I kind of missed all that. And so, to teenage me, the A5000 was the best machine Acorn ever made, and I've wanted one ever since. I could have just ordered one from CJE, but they're 400 pounds, and that felt like too much. So I very efficiently spent a few dozen hours digging around eBay instead, uh, and eventually bought one for 105 pounds, plus another 40 pounds shipping to the USA. Uh, Non-working, spares or repair, but uh, pretty cheap compared to pretty much every other A5000 I've ever seen. So, when the pictures on the listing looked kind of marginal, but maybe okay. The front looked fine, the PCB in this module looked okay. The back was maybe a little rusty. Keyboard, obviously the wrong keyboard, an Archimedes one, not an A5000, but whatever. And oh god, what is this? I, I'm sure this picture wasn't actually on the listing or I wouldn't have bought it. It's the worst corrosion I've ever seen. I may have just been naive about this sort of thing back then and didn't realize that that dark green over the entire board was just disaster. Uh, but I got it anyway. Um, so here we go. Another board out. You see everything everything to the right of the bombs and the, the podger slot there is fine. Uh, everything to the left is just disaster. I cut, had to cut the drive cables because they were so corroded that I couldn't even unplug them from the sockets. Um, got to work. Vinegar, vinegar, scrub with the toothbrush, water, let it dry, still looked awful. So another two vinegar, toothbrush, water cycles followed. Still in pretty, I mean, it was in pretty terrible shape. I'm pretty sure this is, this is before I actually gave it the vinegar treatment. You can see those, those traces between the, um, the CPU and the FPA socket are, um, are awful. I, uh, I, in hindsight, I, I think that might actually be solder mask. That's um, that, that, that kind of greenness there because when I peeled off some solder mask under the crystal, uh, actually the traces were rusty and then the mask was all peeling on top. But um, anyway, this is pretty, Pretty typical for what any of the fine traces around the CPU looked like. Um, they, uh, the um, the clock chip, clock chip was uh, um, a write-off as well. I, I cut it off and pulled off some pads as well. By the looks of things here, um, I like I like this capacitor with a, just a big crack halfway right right through it. Um, and in the end, uh, it's probably it's about as good as I was going to get it. Although that wasn't really that good. I, uh, I felt like I'd overdone it when I looked at how awful these, these pins looked. The, uh, the oscillator can to the right there is all rusty. And uh, yeah, so got rid, of, got rid of some corrosion and then created some corrosion of my own. Uh, of course it didn't work, it didn't fire up. I tried it anyway, no video output regardless of whatever I did on the keyboard. At some point I thought to buzz out the connections from the ARM3 and found that at the very least a bunch of address lines were open circuit. I tried all the obvious things, flux and heat, trying to reflow things with hot air, which is pretty much nothing. Finally, started just trying to solve the wires to fix everything. Like, there was a lot of track damage right next to the CPU, like between, between, uh, between pins and vias that were really, really close. Uh, unfortunately, some which were actually underneath the chip. Um, 
So I, I soldered one wire and then discouraged by the amount of work that took, put it on the shelf and forgot about it for eight months. Um, so one evening in January, January this year now, uh, so, we, so we're about 10 months in, uh, I had a burst of energy, buzzed out every arm three pin, repaired the other 11 pins on the arm three that were connected to damaged tracks. Most uh, concerning one is the DBE pin, which is what NEMC uses to tell the CPU and RAM not to both drive the bus at the same time. If this one's bad, you're very likely to have a bus clash and just start destroying chips. So that, that was um, a little worrying when I saw that. It meant my chances of being able to get this thing to work uh, were pretty low. Yeah, here are my notes at the time. You can see this is you know, I printed out printed out bits from the, the, the LSI um, data sheet collection and uh, I just went through each pin one by one. Although, basically, I crossed off all the FPA ones. I couldn't, didn't even want to try that. But um, there's lots and lots of uh, lots and lots of open circuits. Luckily, a lot were actually still okay. Um, but yeah, still lots of repairs. Uh, most of the time, I had VS to solder to. My micro soldering is not that great, um, as you can see. But it was good enough to uh, to get this connected and not short it. Um, really interesting to see how long this lasts uh, in the future. Um, so, but anyway, after the, the CPU is all connected up, the next uh, the next thing to look at is the connections between MEMC and the address latch chips. There's 20 connections, A2 to A21, uh, and for each for each address line, there's a connection from um, so the the ARM3 connects to the MEMC, and then for each line, connections connects from MEMC to an address latch, and then from the output of the latch to a resistor, and then from the other side of the resistor to a via. So only four of the MEMC lines were bad, but uh, 13 of the latch outputs were, were bad, and 12 of the resistor outputs were bad. So that was a lot of soldering. You can see I've, uh, uh, I haven't, this is, this is before I've actually fixed everything, but you can see all that, uh, those little wires from the resistors to vias, and then I, I believe it's the, um, the, the fire one, the, the clock line, which is the enable to the, um, to the latches. Um, uh, flying in the air there. Uh, so now here they are actually fixed. Um, this looks terrible, but miraculously works. So I didn't realize the 12 megahertz signals would actually be okay on horrible wiring like this, but apparently they are. Um, you can see uh, those, those bottom two latch chips, IC45 and 46. Uh, I had to wire, solar magnet wire to, from all of the up to the resistors. Um, so these are all done now. Uh, the, only, the last problem was that the ARM3 didn't actually have a clock. It uh, was getting nothing on it, and it should be running at 25 megahertz. So uh, there's a, I, I needed to jump it from the, uh, there's something, something in the clock divider. Uh, but now I can finally see something interesting on logic analyzer. So that's really cool. Uh, this is what we're looking at here. That's the five highest order latched address lines, LA21, 2019, 18, and 17. Uh, I'm not sure what that the row is. It says K out, but I don't believe it. And then the top ones are the um, the ICC um, lines to the uh, to the clock chip. But um, so ARM2 and ARM3 chips, when you hold them in reset, they just execute knocks. So their address lines just cycle through the entire address space. So this is a, a nice way to test continuity. You um, hold the chip in reset and just scrape out every output, every address line. Um, and you just should see square waves of different frequencies depending on which, which line you're looking at. Um, after reset, it seemed to do the same, just a bit slower, and then it, um, and it stopped toggling LA21 forever. Um, and now what I know is that that, that that period with the solid blocks there, that's it doing its ROM checksum. It's actually it's reading the contents of the ROM. And then the LA21 forever is the self-test uh, interface protocol, or I think it's trying to output something to do, telling telling you that it's attempting to access the. Uh, oh no, those those are actually the IOC, IOC accesses to try to do something with the the, the clock chip. So I uh, next next step was to try to disassemble Risk OS to to figure out what it was actually doing at the time. Um, I pulled it open in a text editor at first and noticed that um, there was a the word self test followed by a whole lot of useful looking error messages. Um, I, I scrolled through here looking for something Googleable and eventually found the IRQ bad. Threw that one into Google and I got the A540 service manual. It's not in the A5000 service manual or A3000 or anything, but in the A540, all the details are there. Um, 
there was a, uh, a mention of this thing called a debug display interface, the, the post to test uh, interface adapter. Um, so I, um, I thought this was too good to be too good to be true, but also uh, that probably someone else knew about it. So I googled the star dot this, the debug display interface, and turns out this had indeed happened. Around July 2019, while my A5000 was sitting on the shelf, Phil Pemberton had rediscovered the self-test code and implemented the debug adapter side of the self-test protocol, enough to get a target machine to output the detailed self-test output to an LCD in very long. Uh, so in the, in the red rectangle there, you can see the LCD output with the um, results of a risk pcs RAM test, I believe. Um, so here's how this works. The idea with the self-test is that it'll run even if the machine is almost completely broken, as long as you have the CPU, the ROMs, and enough of the address latches to address the first 8K or so of ROM, and the bit of MMC that actually enables the ROM, it'll start. Um, it outputs data to the test adapter using pulses on the LA21 line, so it's the, the A21 pin on the ARM3 which gets latched. Uh, it's LA21. And this address line is only active when accessing past the first two megabytes of ROM, i.e. past the end of RISC-OS. Um, so in, in the diagram here, you see there's the two, the two red X's there. That's LA21 and LA22. Um, RIS, uh, MMC actually, it's, its upper ROM space is actually eight megabytes, uh, but uh, RISC-OS only uses two, so there's two free address lines. Um, so the, it uh, makes accesses to an alias address uh, Two megabytes higher than, than a word in ROM, which is set to zero, and the test adapter sends data back to it by pulling the ROM output enable line up, the, the ROM CS line from the MC, um, which is connected to the ROMs through a 330 ohm resistor, so it's actually overdrivable like this. So this is this is really clever. I'd, I'd seen the test act uh, signal in um, a bunch of Acorn schematics before and had no idea what it was, uh, but here we are. So I didn't. I don't have any LCD units here. Uh, I don't have the CPLD that that, that Phil Pemberton used, but I do have a bunch of smaller Xilinx chips and this breakout board that the one in green on the left, um, and various microcontrollers, including lots of AT Sam D21s. Uh, that's the purple board on the right. Uh, so I decided to hack away at Phil's Verilog and see if I can get it to fit into this smaller Xilinx chip uh, and send data back to the microcontroller using SPI. So um, his system directly drove an LCD. Mine uh, doesn't. Mine ignores all the LCD commands. It just uh, sends everything back to the microcontroller. Um, because I didn't have much spare space at all in the, in the Xilinx chip, it, um, I got the CPLD to um, to drive the communication. So the, the microcontroller is actually doing SPI in slave mode, which apparently didn't like very much. Uh, I don't know if I was violating its timing or what, but there were tons of hard faults. Uh, things would just things would crash all the time, freeze. There's also some weird stuff to do with power. I was powering the um, the microcontroller off USB and the Xilinx off the, the CPLD off the target machine. And it turns out the, the CPLDs aren't five volt tolerant, and it's when they're unpowered. And they think the uh, I would I would find. I would find symptoms of one board powering the other one incorrectly, probably leakage through data lines, all that sort of stuff. So, but it, it was good enough to let me read the post it. So um, here's what the detailed post results looked like for the for the A5000 when it was in really bad shape. Firstly, it was only detecting half a megabyte of memory instead of uh, two. Um, the upper byte bad. All the so the first three bytes on the on the RAM were fine. But the upper byte was bad, uh, so that's possibly four of the four of the chips uh, on the motherboard were bad. Uh, the IOC register test was failing; it was just returning FF regardless of what was written into. So IOC has a couple of registers for I think it's the interrupt mask registers, which are read writes. So you can test that the IOC communications working by writing a byte to them and then reading it back. Uh, a lot of them are write only or read only, but these ones are read write. So Risk OS does it does a test by basically walking a bit. It, it writes, it writes, uh, you know, hex eighty and then hex 40, 20, 10, 8, 4, 2, 1, reads it back and then it does the same inverted. Uh, but basically, just get FF back regardless. Um, 
components. And then wouldn't even get to the end of the test, it just hung at the SRAM part. Uh, this is the symptom of the IOC being inaccessible. Uh, so I spent days trying to figure out what was going on with any of this. Uh, I've seen super weird results, partly where if you ran, even when the external card was selected, uh, the jumpers didn't seem to be doing what they were supposed to. Uh, I eventually realized that the, the RAM multiplexer was broken, and so it was enabling multiple RAM chips at once, which uh, is probably why they've gone bad in the first place. Um, the, the, one that gen the, the chip that generates the, the half signal from the, one, of the, one of the RAM address lines, when you have half your RAM on board and half on an expansion card, uh, and we replace that, and then they've got things to behave sanely and, and uh, start showing a complete failure with when accessing RAM that wasn't fitted. So if I took the external RAM card off, and set the jumpers to only use their card, it would say that every bit was bad. So that was nice. So at least something was improving. Uh, so I was on another dead end until I realized that I, I happened to have a four megabyte SIM card that I bought for another project, which happened to have the exact chips the A5000 would have fitted if set up at four megabytes from the factory, like in the, the later alpha model. So I desoldered two of the RAM chips and soldered them on uh, so IC53 and IC57. So the missing one here and the one above it. Um, so it made it almost work. Uh, there was still something failing until I realized that the corresponding chip to the left of one of them must have gone bad. So I desoldered, uh, I think I desoldered IC56, possibly also IC52, I'm not quite sure. And the round test passed. So it's to desoldering. Uh, my wife shot this. Uh, this. It looks like possibly I'm. I think I was trying to put chip quick into the, um, uh, use the, the low temperature chip quick on it um, to, to get that chip off. Uh, I posted this on startup and Liam Welsh replied with this. <laughs> Quite like titanium cyborg apparently. Uh, apparently has a similar desoldering technique to me. Um, so anyway, the RAM test now passes. So that was really nice. It's detecting one megabyte and not showing any errors on the data lines or the address lines. Still IOC problems. This was a complete mystery. I buzzed more things out, sold more wires from MC to IOEB for the higher address lines. Still no apparent results. Buzzed things out, sold the test points all over the place, probed things, all seemed fine, just no IOC or IOEB activity. I had no luck to get any, getting anything to work reliably with, reliably with the post adapter aside from reading the self-test output. So eventually I tried writing some test code and running it using ArcFlash, which is my, uh, my Flash ROM emulator uh, for our committee's boards. Uh, and it seemed to show some activity until I shorted a data line with the scope probe, which caused the arc flash board to dramatically overheat and die, uh, at which point I kind of got fed up with this whole project, put it on the shelf. I did, however, have three A3000 boards sitting around, though. Mark Hazeman of Retro Clinic sold them to me a year or two back, and I'd had a go at fixing them. The best I could do was to get some shaky video output of the arc flash bootloader on one. The post output uh, led me straight to the issues, however. This one here had two broken data lines between the CPU and RAM. The post output showed a RAM data line test failure. Uh, this is not fixed yet, but you'll see some red wires from the CPU over to those RAM resistors on the right. Uh, it also failed a whole lot of I IOC tests because LA19 uh, was disconnected between the address latch and the IOC. And the RAM was also bad, but not so bad that it was blocking the data bus. So now I have this one running with a four megabyte card from Chris Morby. So here's, I assume this is probably the, um, the IOC line break, or I'm not sure actually which one, but uh, I fixed everything on the top. You can see this has two red wires on the bottom there. Actually, this is not a picture of the fully fixed board. I have the fixed board sitting right behind me. Uh, it's got some more wires on it, but um, these, this, this got the RAM test to pass and then the IOC was next. Uh, okay, onto the next board. So this one uh, is the one that you saw drawing rectangles on the screen next to me earlier. Uh, this one wouldn't even run self-test at all. It had two data lines disconnected at the ROM, uh, so it couldn't read the ROM and thus couldn't read the self-test code. Uh, the disconnected ones were an easy fix, but one was actually stuck high, which turned out to be a bad RAM chip. So the, the RAM, the bad RAM chip was even when the RAM was disconnected, it was still um, it was still pulling a data line high, uh, which meant that nothing else would work. So the, the solution was to just pull off the chip. Now these these are through hole and horribly corroded, so um, the best way to fix them was to just uh, twist them back and forward and uh, 
until until they snapped off. So you can see there's two missing RAM chips there. I think I think I had two issues there. Uh, so I did that, and then there's a uh, you can see the IC28 modification there. That's a change to the multiplexer uh, to make the this board just use an external RAM card. So it's it's um, it's using an external one megabyte card, which is not something which you can normally do. This day three thousand. This card was designed to uh, work in tandem with the uh, with the onboard RAM, as opposed to overriding it. Uh, board number three. My daughter gave me some help with that. So it's her first uh, her first uh, Acorn repair project. Um, this board, I believe, was a really interesting one because it looked relatively clean, although it was missing all of its capacitors. So presumably, someone decided that it needed a thorough recapping removed all the capacitors and then got sick of it and dumped it on my pavement. So, uh, so I finished that. There, there was a lot of capacitor soldering to do that. Uh, <laughs> they're all, all sh pretty shiny and nice now. I don't know if any of that was necessary because these boards don't seem to really get bad capacitors. But um, yeah, so it, it didn't boot. Self-tested ROM showed me that the ROM was aliasing. So one of the ROM address lines was bad. Uh, and the video and sound IOQ test was failing. The address line is A15, which is broken between the ARM2 and uh, the relevant address latch. The, the video and sound IRQs were because uh, I'd sort of gotten a whole lot of capacitors, but there were some headers and jumpers that I needed to add. So putting those in, the video was now clocked, and it'll work. So, repair tips for A3000s. If it doesn't post at all, check the CPU, MEMC, latches, and ROMs. If you get a memory error, memory error the RA and RD lines from MC through to, through to the RAM. The RAM chips themselves are, seem to be really frequently bad. I found three, my A5000 and two of the A3000 had bad memory chips. Uh, in two cases, bad enough that they were actually causing other things to fail until they removed the chips. Uh, and and uh, why are I think I think that's a mistake. Don't check the ledgers, check that kind of post. Um, IOC, the IOQ, SIOQ errors. That's usually address lines to the IOC or control lines from the IOC to the data ledgers. And then pretty much every board you see you'll have an error with the SRAM chip. So yeah, that's been tortured to death. So I um, having given up on the A5000 and having fixed on my A3000s, so I was at kind of a loose end. So I decided to make a better version of the of my, of my CPLD post box, my, my flaky CPLD post box. This is something which is on Phil Pemberton's to-do as well. He was thinking of using this, this exact FPGA actually, which is one that I happened to buy a few of a little, while, a little while back, and I was kind of looking for an excuse to do something to use them. It's a really small FPGA, but it also happens to be basically as big as the biggest CPLD you can buy. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of the nature of things with FPGAs and CPLDs. Uh, that this FPGA start where CPLDs finish, and they're also a two dollar FPGA is equivalent to like a thirty dollar, forty dollar uh, CPLD. So uh, definitely a nice upgrade. But they are modern chips; they don't like running at five volts, that kind of thing. So I was getting really sick of trying to fit logic into seventy two or one hundred and forty four registers. Uh, so yeah, so I, I used this this FPGA, and then the 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 right hand side of the board is basically it's, it's I just started with the, um, the microcontroller board, which I, I used in the, in the original the original post box, and it's kind of you know, extended it out and added the FPGA and, and all the buffers on it. So the inside the FPGA, it's a fully synchronous design. That's like the the, the original is uh, had two clocks, with, uh, clocked on both a, a timer and on the test ACK, uh, which which worked fine for the worked fine with LCD, but I it's it, it's something you can kind of get away with the CPLDs, and you pretty much can never get away with an FPGA. So I wanted to knock that one off again. Uh, and I put lots of thought into making it hot pluggable um, because of the powering issues I'd had, uh, and also powering issues I'd had in, in other projects. So I really didn't want to have it so that you know the USB line, USB power would accidentally get fed into the target machine or vice versa. The target machine would start trying to power this when I didn't want it to. Uh, so I discovered the 74 LCX series of, uh, of logic, which is kind of amazing. It's it's high, it's five volt tolerant, but it's high impedance while powered off. As opposed, to, it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have the same kind of protection for the 
uh, protection dies to the 5 volt line. I don't know how it handles um, ESD protection, but um, but it, uh, it would actually work. Uh, like the setup's really nice. Um, so, but yeah, it can handle 5 volts while it's powered off, with it, which is something that the, um, the XC9500 XL CPLDs cannot do. Um, so yeah, so here's the, here's the board, sold it up. Um, it's gonna get 48 megahertz clock from the microcontroller. Uh, dividing that down, it's, it's horribly jittery on my, on my scope, um, but it worked. <laughs> and so success, the first board works really well. It's, it seemed flaky initially, but it was, it was a software issue, I believe, because I, I wanted it to behave like a, just like a serial port. Uh, so it would give you this sort of serial uh, USB serial port to the post um, protocol. Uh, so my, my first task for it was to read out the ROM from a Bush Internet IBX250, one of the kind of lesser known Acorn derived machines, sort of kind of like an A7000. Uh, once that worked, I had set up with one of the one of the now fixed A2000s. I uh, wrote a program to set up an MC and video and test the RAM by writing random data and reading it back. Uh, once that worked, I decided to have a bit more fun. So um, this is what happens when I, I write, I can, I can write to the screen memory. So I can write to the vid C registers to get, uh, to get the, um, get everything set up at first. Um, and then once, once I'm in mode 15, I think it is, I could, you know, just start drawing rectangles everywhere. Uh, so I, I got debug this on the working A3000 and then I tried it on the A5000 just, you know, to see if it would go. So I hadn't tried all the vid C side of things. It crashed on the first try, but it worked fine once I realized that you need to just configure an MC differently. Because uh, the A5000 has a 12 megahertz. Um, MC runs at 12 megahertz, and so you need to have more wait states to uh, read the ROM. Um, so I, I sat there enjoying watching this, this A5000, which I realized now is a little less broken than I thought, uh, watching it for rectangles on the screen. And then I wrote some code to repeatedly read the IOEB's ID register, which is the, the failing Part one, part one of the failing parts of the, um, of the, of the F5000's test. Try to set frequency on the, the, the board pin, the uh, IOC's unused square wave generator, uh, and then poked at things with my scope for ages. So, how MEMC does a transaction with IOC is to hold the CPU clock, assert IO, the IO request line, wait for IOC to assert IO, the IO ground line, pass the data back to the CPU. So when stuff is happening, when IO stuff is happening, you should see lots of load periods on IO request, what and load pulses on IO graph to be. There's lots of that. However, the data lines weren't behaving properly. Uh, the, the S5 the line, which is the selector for IOPD, was showing lots of activity, but the data lines just were not behaving. Um, so I went hunting for things which were stuck pulling the pulling the data lines up. So I was I, I, I put a 1K resistor to ground from the from BD1, which should have pulled it down when it wasn't active, but it never did. Uh, it wasn't the buffer chips because the, their, their output maybe was not always active. Um, eventually traced it down to the IOR line, which uh, is the, uh, it's the, read, the read enable line for the super IO chip, which does all the, um, the, the drives and stuff. Um, so it turns out that this, the trace on the circuit board, it goes from the IOEB down on the back of the circuit board up to the front of the circuit board through all the horribly corroded stuff to the IDE uh, connector and then back up to the, uh, the super IO chip. Uh, and it was broken on the front of the board in the corroded area. So soldering a wire across, and now my bus was a little, little bit better. IOEB still not detected, uh, but at least I could, I could drive the bus, I could drive the boat. My, my K resistor. So I was just trying to poke it, look at everything, look for anything that wasn't right. Uh, eventually I was, I thought to maybe it's accessing the wrong register, maybe I had a bug in my post box. Uh, and so I scoped all the address lines and found it was indeed reading the wrong register. It, instead of 3350050, it was reading something that ended in 90. So looking in detail at all the things that should have been happening around there. So Here's the Phi 1, which is the inverted system clock, uh, which is also the latch, um, the latch enable line to the address latches. The uh, output of LA1, maybe? LA2, probably? And the IO request line. 
I found that the address just wasn't latching. My, my latch was just in transparent mode all the time, just even when it's, um, even when it's, uh, um, even when it should have been latching. So it was time to desolder another chip. Uh, luckily, it was the one with the least, the fewest little wires soldered onto it. <laughs> so it wasn't too hard to remove and replace. Here we go. Here's the chip off. Still some wires floating in the air. Um, it's pretty clean looking. The ears underneath don't, and traces underneath don't look too bad, I think, by virtue of this being the furthest from the, uh, the leaky battery. And with a new latch, it booted. This is a little unbelievable. I've been working on and off on this machine for 15 months at this point. And I just internalized that it, it was never going to be repaired. Um, but yeah, so what you see here is what happens if you boot an A5000 with no CMOS chip at all. It doesn't know what modules should be plugged in. And so it's a lot of work to get to the desktop. Luckily, I had the standalone board for testing the PCF8583 chips. And so I plugged that into the Econet and module slots and it booted. Uh, booted into the desktop. Uh, but it, it's... Um, Actually, no, I didn't get to the desktop. It booted and was a little happy. But the post still wasn't passing. It was showing error and then internal MMC error. Uh, this wasn't good news because if that was really the case, my, I would have to replace my MMC. And it was, as you've seen, it's covered in wires. Um, and uh, yeah, not soccer to. So I spent some time looking at the Restoris code for the MMC test, realized my mid set of RAM chips was perhaps the cause. I had two 4 megabit chips and six 1 megabit chips. And the 4 megabit chips would be respecting the RA9 pin and the one which chips wouldn't be. Um, so they'd be aliasing at different addresses. So of course, more desoldering. So I got these six chips off. Uh, found that it's, you can actually remove RAM chips from a SIM. You can remove all the chips from a SIM quite nicely by just sticking it on a hot plate and turning it up for a while. Uh, so I got all those chips off, soldered six new chips on here. Um, and uh, actually, here's, the, here's what I did to get a new, um, new clock chip in. I got one of my boards with a super cap um, and soldered just onto the gears and just some random places to get power and ground. Um, so this is sitting on top of the FPA 11 socket, which I'm also not going to use. And uh, look at that, you have four megabytes and it boots cleanly. So that was really cool. Uh, the floppy drive or hard drive, obviously, uh, but it works. <laughs> so um, despite the success with IOEB, I was, still wasn't confident about the Super IO chip, but OS read sysinfo uh, confirmed that it was alive. Um, so this, that, that number there, the 105 means that uh, it's, it's recognized that it has an IO controller chip, which can do a hard drive, floppy drive, parallel serial port, and has been configured, I guess. So, uh, fixing enough wires to get a floppy drive working turned out to be kind of awful. There's tons and tons of wires soldered on the other side of the board. I have pages and pages of notes. Here's the only, here's the only photo I could get without having to completely disassemble the machine. But here are some of my notes. I, uh, I printed out some photos and I wrote on them with this gold pen, which worked quite well. Traced lots and lots of lines from magnified, uh, magnified pictures of the back of the board, and the front of the board. I posted these on Startup as well in case anybody's trying to do the same repair. Um, but all of these gold lines are wires that I needed to solder to get uh, the floppy drives working. So tons and tons of wires on the back. Uh, and uh, didn't need to solder most of these ones at the front, most of them have it on the back. I thought about trying to solder all the wires for the IDE, uh, but there's, there's so many. Uh, so I used one of Ian Stocksy's IDE modules, uh, which Works pretty well, so um, keeping it. <laughs> and here it is. I put an arc flash in it uh, to, to check out for um, Steve 3000. Uh, he's just got one working in an A540. Those uh, rainbow colored wires in the bottom right, those, those lead off to the, to the post box. And that red wire, I believe, is the one that fixes IOR. You can see Ian's, uh, the corner of Ian's module on the left. So there it goes, it works. So uh, now I'm making these, uh, these boards for people. I've sent out three of them so far, Phil Pemberton, uh, Andy Nightingale, and uh, C3000, whose last name uh, slips to my mind right now. We've all gotten them working, seen some interesting results. Um, Phil made the unfortunate discovery that I uh, completely forgot to think through what might happen if the board was plugged in backwards. 
the answer is that the two buffer chips burn up immediately and some unhealthy voltages get injected into the target system by um, revision to a, uh, put some work into making sure that does not happen. Uh, I don't recommend plugging it in backwards, but at least it, it won't kill itself this time. Um, I have the PCBs that I'll be building now that I'm not spending all of my spare time writing this presentation. Um, and then on the right, there's, uh, there's the latest version of ArcFlash, which you know, a much neglected project of mine, uh, which I, I kind of got a bit down on after burning one up uh, while fixing the A5000. I definitely don't want that happening in other people's machines. Uh, so um, I kind of forgot about it for a while, but I've, I think I figured out, figured out why that happened and I have a fix for it. So I'll be making those stuff again soon too. And with that, that's all my slides. So uh, I guess uh, I'll uh, shut off the uh, screen share and we can go to questions. Thank you, Phil. That was, that was brilliant. Uh, epic repairs. That's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it. Uh, the, 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 the repair the that level I... of dogged uh, determination <laughs> to get that thing up and running to say 400 quid at CJE um, yeah. is incredibly Im impressive. <laughs> um, what, I, I, I guess, I, well, I, I, I don't know. I, I suspect pr pretty much everyone watching this could attest to the sort of tenacity needed to get, get these things up and running or, or actually complete a, a project of any description. Um, was it worth it? I... <laughs> I, I think yes. I have learned so much. Uh, I was going to say, it's like repairing A5000s is easy. All you need to do is uh, devote months of your life uh, to understanding every little detail of the circuit board, um, design a design and build a debug interface, <laughs> and, and repair a bunch of other machines. <laughs> and, then, and then it's all done. Um, so what I, I, I will do is, um, Ian Smallsher says, if you want an A5000 in a worse state, he's got one. Um, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I, oh, God, this, so, I thought this was the best they came. I, that was pretty, pretty bad, I have to say. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, so uh, it's, it's funny. Lots of people will say, oh, can you repair my A5000 for me? Or can you repair my wrist PC for me? And invariably, the comment would be, the amount of time it would take if you were charging a reasonable amount <laughs> yeah. of money for the level of skill involved in actually trying to debug this thing and work out what the hell's going on. <laughs> yeah. You may as well just go to CG and buy one. Yes, it would, it would be cheaper to buy it a new one from CG. Actually cheaper. I know, um, I, so I did spend 400 pounds at CJE to buy myself a risk PC. Uh, and I, I felt that was money well spent because I, um, I didn't even want to think about trying to repair one of those, although uh, I've got, <laughs> it was got probably got actually would have been. Here, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> so well, does, I... <laughs> does does anyone else have any questions for Phil or about this this horrendously arduous process? Um, so. Ed, oh, did I did I unmute people? So Ed's got a. I mean, you can do these v verbally as well. So please, please do. Um, Ed says, uh, just a comment. I have two A three thousands to fix, and will be very happy when he gets his card. Uh, the light goes on with one with a drive attached. It was on when the power was on and turned off when the power was applied. Any ideas? Um, the other machine has to have its power plug changed and the PSU to be. 120 volts linked. Um, and then another person says, did you ever consider recreating the whole PCB? I did consider recreating the bottom half of the PCB. Now the problem with the A5000 is that it's really hard to get replacement ARM3 chips. Um, uh, I wouldn't even like to think about trying to get a replacement IOEB chip. Uh, although that's that's on the top half of the piece again. So um, yeah, I I, kind of, I considered that, but I think I just kept repairing this one little bit by bit, and eventually got there. And so yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, I 
thought it's at one point that I that the CPU itself could be bad or that there would really be no hope. And I was wondering about doing something where um, we basically have an FPGA board that would plug into the, um, the, the module slot and would try to you know, inject the signals back in there. Um, although I think it still wouldn't give you enough. Um, I'm pretty sure the module slot's under the bottom half of the address bus. So, uh, sorry, the bottom half, yes, bottom half of the data bus and only the latched address bus. So yeah, you'd still end up soldering wires all over the place. So yeah, I couldn't think of a nice way to do it. So having, having sort of unpicked one of these machines from the inside out, what do you think of the design of it as an engineer? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I mean, I was, there's some, Excellent hacking went into trying to deal with having 12, uh, basically speeding up the bus to 12 megahertz without changing anything about the IO side. Uh, something I'm always amazed at and the, um, and the Acorn machines is the amount of backward compatibility. Um, like if you, you spend some time, uh, you spend some time digging around in a beep and learning about the one megahertz bus uh, and how Econet works, um, the IOC has the IOC and NIMS actually yeah, it's just the IOC. So the IOC has a has a timing option where it will do all accesses synchronous to a two megahertz clock. I think the reason for this is so you can use the same Econet module in a BBC Master, and every Archimedes machine. Um, I believe the A the thirty twenty and four thousand. They, they changed it at that point. But at A5000, you can still use an Econet module from a BBC Master, uh, mm. which that's, that's kind of amazing. The only difference in the 3020 and 4000 was the pins were shorter. Oh, I see. That's, yeah, that's but, it. Like, I think that's, like, that, was, <laughs> that was very cool. Um, they really, it's like in modern machines, you, you, know, you just kind of assume that, you know, oh, we're, we're USB-C now, I have to buy everything again. But in mm. those days, it was really like, oh, you can take all these bits out of the BBC Master and put them in your A310, and oh, now you're off an A5000. That's okay, you think the bits still work. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's kind of amazing, right? um, the you know, peripherals. And, um, yeah. Uh, I, so you can, see, uh, you can see on the screen here, that's my, this is my memory testing, uh, memory test code, which um, it's, it's writing, uh, it's it's writing data into the into this into this A three thousand here. It's writing data straight into its into its screen memory. Um, and before I can do this, it needs to write a bunch of uh, write a bunch of words to, to the the vidc control register to set up the um, set up the screen mode. And looking at the so this this doesn't work on a risk PC or an A seven thousand. So one of the one of my mm. to dos is to get that to work. If, if you know, Maddie Nightingale doesn't get it done first, but um, uh, the, uh, the, the new vidc, the registers still look pretty similar. It's kind of like, you, you, as you go from machine to machine, even into the RISC PC, they kept a lot of the design. I mean, presumably this was because they didn't want to re-implement it. Uh, they, you know, they didn't have the time. They, they said that the Acorn, um, Acorn advantage was that they had no money and no people. So, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's probably why. But, yeah, uh, that's, but an that's kind of nice. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> familiar. Uh, yeah, the advantage. But yeah, um, but yeah so, so I'm hoping not to have to do too much work to get, you know, to get this working on the newer machines. Um, they, they kind of sped everything up and tried to keep as much of the old stuff as possible. I mean, that, you, know, that, you, could, mm. you could call that a plus or a minus, but uh, yeah, something in the archaeologist side of me that, that I find that appealing. Yeah, I, I guess it was a plus at the time, probably a minus as they tried to sort of move on. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, indeed, a, 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 a proper stick in the spokes, as it were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic! Does anyone else have any questions? You can verbally pitch them. Um, I'm. I am um, just sorry. I. <laughs> however, that was to finish. 
Hi there. Um, it's nice to see one of my podules in there, but do you think you'll ever go back and get the uh, onboard IDE working? Oh, I, um, I don't think so, no. Not on this machine. Um, so the, uh, what um, I was all ready to be able to do it. Because they say they basically what you've got to do is the 16, 16 wires would need to be soldered from the, so basically none of the tracks were, uh, were intact. So I think it's basically 16 wires to solder from those, the resistors next to the module um, socket. 16 wires from those to the uh, latches for the, for the IDE. And then 16 wires from those to various vias which connect to the IDE socket. Um, and I found when I started buzzing things out that not all of those resistors were even connected to their associated data lines. So um, luckily, yeah, your module still works just fine, uh, despite its, its data lines not being properly terminated. But um, uh, yeah, I would probably end up having to have something that plugs into one of the module sockets to get some of those, some of those data lines anyway, at which point it's like, it, it's a module, why don't you use yours? <laughs> Um, I would like, it would be really nice to have it, have ADFS, uh, being able to see the hard drive like it would in an unmodified machine, but uh, I can look at that. I, I think most people's experience would be that it's not very nice having ADSF, ADFS attempting to see the hard drive. Uh, yes, well, I have um, seen Because invariably about it doesn't too. work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think the only thing I want to say is that I'm just awestruck and I've already said this privately that mm. you <laughs> you took what was a throwaway project of mine to try and recover a risk PC board that is sat down there and beyond repair uh, that has a very similar fault to yours by the looks of it mm. and you've not only finished what I started but you've you've gone ahead and did what I gave up on with repair. <laughs> so uh, my hat goes off to you. This, this has been, I, I can't express the level of joy I had just reading the messages on Stardot and the PMs going back and forth about this. <laughs> A little bit of archaeology has turned into something truly great from my perspective anyway. I don't know whether anyone else agrees with me. I hope we do. Well, thank you. It's it was it was very very cool that um, to, to to I was uh, I was really happy when I found I found your work that you you'd already done the, the hard work of, of proving that this thing actually still worked and the documentation was actually correct and uh, I, I I think starting from your code it was probably a, an evening an evening or two of work to uh, to get to work well. I wasn't actually working post output just yet. What I, I think what I ended up doing was using the, um, having the CPLD telling, telling the, uh, the A5000 to, to give me the post output, but it wasn't making, making it to the microcontroller yet. And so I just saved a logic analyzer trace and had a Python script that would look at the pulses mm -hmm. and extract everything out. But like, once I got that working, I, I saw actual post output. It's like, oh my God, you know, this, this really works. It, it turned, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I do quite like finishing other people's projects because uh, they've done that. <laughs> they've done one of the hard parts and uh, for that I thank you. It was, it was very, very cool. What was it? Um, I think, think it was Tricky earlier said uh, he likes doing the tricky parts and then uh, lose his interest afterwards and that's kind of me. <laughs> I, I feel that's a little bit of a relatable comment for me. Um, so that's kind of what happened with, with that. And I think it probably took me about a week once I found the, to be R540 or A5, whatever it was, service manual with all this info in there. And of course it's in there right the way up until RISCOS 3.71. The self-test was only removed for RISCOS 4. So any, as long as you've got a 3.7 ROM set or a 3.6 or 3.5 ROM set, any RISC PC you can run this on. Why, why would you ever want to run anything later than 3.7? Well, I would run 3.71 just so you don't have to oh, mess around with the ROM patch. Okay, that's fine. Four, well, though. I've got, 
I've got four on my wrist PC under the table and it works all right. It's nice having long file names, but I could live without them. I don't think any proper legacy software requires them, though, does it? No, no. Um, in fact, the level four file server I've had trouble with in the last week or two uh, because it assumes that ADFS will truncate the file name at 12 characters. And if it doesn't, and you write a file name with longer than 12 characters, it gets a little bit upset. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun. That's that's awesome. I uh, we, we I may uh, end up jumping in on on one of your Econet projects at some point as well. Uh, I was that's that's something that I've been interested in for a little while, but it got pushed aside in, in favor of uh, well, I, I guess ArcFlash was the first. I, I tend to so I tend to do kind of the same thing as you do that tricky part of the problem or prove that it's possible or get something just vaguely working and then get excited by something else. Um, luckily with the post box, there were two tricky problems. So you could do one and I could do the other one. But uh, uh, yeah, so, um, oh, the, what I was going to say is I can confirm that uh, NCOS also has the post uh, code Ooh. in it. So this is a, here's a Bush IBX 250. Uh, which this, I've got a thread about it with lots of pictures and stuff, but it has, it has the same, uh, the same non-polarized uh, post header uh, as as the um, all the machines that came before it, and so, yeah. So Phil, does that have a vid C in it? It has a, uh, a PS seventy five hundred. So it's oh, like an eight, okay. So this so this thing it's basically uh, it's it's basically it's an a, a it's an A seven thousand. So uh this part of it's basically an a7000 except yeah, yeah. for video i believe they they got rid of a lot of the video circuitry and instead they pass everything over to this board over here which has some SCART outputs on it so yeah, i think yeah. it takes the composite signal and sends it out to SCART, which is well, it's, right. it's, it's really it's really good right. video quality but uh, and also there's a, a modem module phil to the board I, I want i want to see that playing starfighter <laughs> people have gotten them um so i've seen the net box is playing starfighter i saw flibble flibble peter managed oh to yes i'm running that but uh seeing the bush <laughs> that would be interesting it's like it, it, it doesn't it. it doesn't actually have a um so it's it didn't ship with an actual keyboard it's got this sort of weird infrared thing uh but it does have the uh, the double decker socket that'll let you plug in a PS2 keyboard and mouse. So I, 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 found, I found that part of the GT. So this one is going to one day get, um, I mean, so, so, so my, my project stack right now, so it's like if you, were, if you heard me speaking about a month or so ago about this, uh, this thing here, the, the ultimate electron upgrade. So there's that, yeah, yeah. there's ArcFlash, which is, uh, oh, which is this, um, and also the, the board down here. Um, that's, that is, so, and then obviously it's the post box. So I think the first thing I am going to do, oh, and also look what arrived, look what arrived in the mail this morning. I, I managed to pick up a Valiant Turtle. Uh, oh. it, it showed up as buy it now on eBay for 185 pounds. It comes with the communicator module and the batteries aren't even corroded. So I, I, I'm really, really happy about that. So I'm going to be hunting down, good, hunting down that. So the Acorn score. software for it, because for some reason it came with the Windows driver but none, none of the Acorn stuff. So this is kind of a, you know, the Acorn, Acorn stuff is all over the place. I'm sure you'll find yeah. it. I, I was going to say... In um, fact, I think Simon has Simon it. Yeah, Simon Lins has been uh, talking to the uh, original designers and has a, a lot of the internal documentation. Right. Yes, I've seen his, I've seen his post about it. And now it all you need is, so. a, is a decent Acorn soft logo copy. Yes, I have a manual for one of them. I, I had logo when I was a kid. So I had an electron I mean, and then I had an A4000. So this is my, uh, I used to, <laughs> logo is one of my first programming languages, basic and logo. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, so oh. the ne next thing I'm going to do is um, make some of the version two post boxes. And uh, because I really do want to, you know, get past that doing the, the tricky part of a project and actually, so basically I've, I've made a lot of things just for myself and, mm -hmm. uh, and, would, and then I get a little bit sad when no one else uses them, but of course they don't because they never gave them to anyone. So uh, it's that finish bit, isn't it? Yeah. 
so this post box, it's like, uh, luckily the, the one I sent to, the one I sent to Phil, uh, it looked like it was a goner, but he replaced a couple of chips and then it was okay again. So, uh, the next, about that. I, <laughs> well, that, that was really good because if it, you know, <laughs> I see that the, the, the fear, the fear I have is that I will send something to somebody who is not as technically minded as you are and they will, you know, they'll, they'll burn something up and, you know, so we some priceless hardware will go, uh, will, will get destroyed. Uh, it's like, so I try to, I try to send these things to the people I know won't be too upset if, uh, if, you know, chips get, chips suddenly start overheating or their, um, you know, the risk PC stops working for a little while, you know, uh, before I send honestly, it to them. Honestly, <laughs> it was broken anyway. <laughs> yeah. If they can't yeah, work said, out which but, way to plug it in, it's their own lookout. <laughs> So that's the uh, <laughs> nice thing. It's a nice thing about the post box. It's like people won't be using it on working machines. Uh, that's the whole point. Arc Flash on the other hand. You, so I was I was really nervous when Steve three thousand tried out Arc Flash on his A five forty. I was like, oh god, please, please don't, please don't break it. But it, it works, so that's that's good. So I put I one in my A five. I was really nervous as well. <laughs> yeah, when I tried it. <laughs> yes, but, uh, but especially when I when I um. Uh, burnt the well programmed it because i've never <laughs> programmed anything from from windows before and it I, i'm sure i spotted lots of mis number mismatches flash past on the screen so. oh and i never explained that so so uh, for, the, for the benefit of everyone else steve sent me an email and he was like well i programmed it and it seemed to you know the script succeeded but it, it gave me a lot of things that looked like errors it said mismatch all the time so what it actually does is it's um it's trying to be efficient about its programming it, um, it sends it sends a block over to the to, to ArcFlash. ArcFlash, Arc, ArcFlash tests the flash to see if it's already got that data in it. And if it has, it's just, it's okay. Don't give me that. And if it if it doesn't match, it's this mismatch. Okay, now let's reprogram this block. Uh, so every time something needs programming, it'll send mismatch. That's that's not actually an error, even though it looks like one. So okay. I obviously have a little work to do on my user interface. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I've got I've got some some further ideas which, I, which I'll send you, which might make that That's, a bit bit more yeah. user friendly for for those who who might not be able to deal with programming themselves. But yeah. yes, so yeah, so once I've got some art, once I've got some post boxes made and sent out to people, then I'm going to be uh, trying to work my way through the the, the art flash uh, wanted list. I think this I think this. A lot of people want a lot of them. Um, I'm going to try and get everyone one, <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll see. I'm mean, just basically have to try to sort people by, you know, that, like I was saying, that the combination of technical ability and uh, and the chill factor in case something goes wrong, um, and get get them to the get it, them to the, the people with this. <laughs> so yeah, the ner the nervous bit is about sending something out because because actually when when you send something out out the ability of people to break something that you thought you'd actually tested is quite high. <laughs> yes. So, so my, my technique with ArcFlash is basically to be to send out one and then wait about four months and then send out another one. So, um, four so, years is probably not realistic. <laughs> so, so Ian, Ian S, uh, Ian Stocks, uh, Ian Stocks has the, uh, has the first, uh, ArcFlash mm. board that I let out of my own hands. And Steve yeah. 3000 has the second one. Um, and Ian found a puzzling issue. I think his machine just sort of, you know, sometimes it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't go up in flames, but uh, yeah, so, you know, so things like that make me nervous. So, Morty mm. bugging. <laughs> are you left with the sense after having played with these things that, that a lot of the Acorn machines are running on the edge, <laughs> as it were, of, of, of you know, it, it's more sort of by luck than by guile that they're actually functioning appropriately. Yeah, like all the things Chris Morley found out about the, the MEMC, the quality of the signals output by MEMC, uh, that's, uh, that's interesting findings there. Or, or are, we, are we suffering from the fact that modern components are actually decent and, and just old components mask an awful lot of the crap? Yeah. yeah. I would agree. I mean, tolerant, aren't they? Mm. Um, yes. Larger silicon feature sizes. It'd be beyond the order of. Well, they wouldn't be under a micron, would they? Mm. Well, maybe arm was. Six ten might be. Mm. You also have to 
point out the fact that test gear has leaped ahead a lot quicker. Oh, yeah. And if it works, are you really going to hunt, go hunting for trouble? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is true. Well, no, I mean, it's that uh, apocryphal tale that Steve Ferber tells of the resistor pack, which is in the Beeb, that it literally is the finger. It's the engineer's <laughs> finger that made it work. <laughs> yeah, but you get you get it you get it in other you get it in other computers. I mean, like Sinclair didn't realise until after he started mass producing ZX Spectrums that the CPU never refreshes the lower RAM. <laughs> so, so the RAM only happens to survive because the manufacturer's tolerance of the refresh is sufficient that the ULL doing video work keeps it refreshed even though the ull doesn't actually bother reading anything <laughs> in between displaying the picture so uh, uh, and you'll find this you go digging into all these old computers you'll find those design mistakes but it worked no there's that it gem was... about the arm um, second processor for the beeb as well the um the first prototype i i can't remember who said this story originally a little part of me wants to say sophie wilson um, and the story goes that the first one they forgot to wire up the power supply that is to the right. first arm chip, yeah. and it worked anyway because it was sucking power through the ESD yeah. protection. It ran off the leakage. Yeah, no, Steve, Steve Ferber tells that tale. So, uh, right. yeah, actually, I believe, believe I've it seen was. this. They thought, oh, this is low power, and uh. <laughs> oh dear, it's very low power. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, oh, seen I I've seen 74 HC Logic do that as well. I've seen Pick Micros do it. <laughs> There's quite a few that will do it. And, uh, uh, closer, closer to home, uh, Ian's ADE card um, in the A5000 does it. Uh, so there's a there's a jumper which you can use because I believe the it's it's designed to to be able to be plugged directly into the um, the the the, the, puddles, the expansion slot on an A310 board if you don't have a backplane except you need to run an extra power line and so you need to run so you, you need to uh, connect five volts to a spade terminal somewhere um, and so I had the jumper set wrong when I plugged it into the A5000, so it wasn't actually getting power from the backplane, but the ROM still worked. It's just the disk didn't work. And so I, I still got my ZIDFS uh, ROM. Uh, um, so that I, I could see it and I could configure it, but I just couldn't access the disk. When I changed that jumper, everything worked. So I wouldn't believe how many times I've pitch. done that during testing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had the RCA box, the set-top box, but unfortunately they made it less hackable. They soldered the flash ROMs in and they took out the command line. So Nothing, like, Chad, that cannot be fixed with a bit of hot air and some Kynar wire. <laughs> <laughs> I would certainly desolder those flash chips and see if the IBX ROMs worked on it. <laughs> Hey, they might. No, I, I, rec I reckon you can get that going as something useful. I mean, you're actually not physically located too far from me, so once you know, yeah, once we're allowed to actually... Happening, I probably would have given it to you. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, uh, is that, I assume it's got, it's the same, it's, it's the, the ARM 7500. The, yeah, it's the same yeah. chip, different board layout, but... Yeah. I was going to say, pull it off. Yeah. I was going to say, silly question: Has it still got the parallel port, or will it boot off a zip drive? Uh, it doesn't <laughs> have the command, the star dot interface in it. Although they actually removed that. Um, so, does it have a uh, what looks like a PC card? Does it have a PC yeah, card slot? Yeah. So I believe the. Um, I, the, the IBX 250 has the, um, has the footprint for that on the circuit board. It's not soldered in. Um, but I believe with the, the NC machines, the idea was that you could have a replacement ROM on a PC card. And it was, it was not like an actual, it, was, it, it didn't match the actual PC card spec. It was some special A-point thing. 
and that would override the ROM on the server port. So you could upgrade the, um, you could switch in a different ROM using that. So if you, you know, if you want to do a really audacious hack uh, on your um, on your NC machine, that's the way to do it. I'm just, I don't know whether you saw the chat, but but Peter just said it should have the command line on it, just disabled using a clever trick you can work around. Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And you may find that it still has the, the self-test interface, uh, just not soldered on or, um, like I think I had to solder in pins on the IBX 250. And I know the IBX 200, which is the sort of the cross-reduced version, uh, it has uh, some kind of um, uh, JST um, socket on board uh, for that. This bright orange, this bright orange pin header. Um, so it's possible. So something I haven't I haven't done this on any of the the non MMC machines yet. But you can uh, write a program into RAM and run it from there. So you could basically soft load a different version of Risk OS, which is a popular thing to do on the um, Risk PC class machines. So sorry, Daniel. I texted you by mistake. Oh, that's all right. Uh, where's that? Uh, which doc? Oh, the command. Uh, do you know what? Um, Peter, Peter, talk to Chad. Tell him. Yeah. Tell him. <laughs> 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 That's flibble. <laughs> on the uh, just on the subject of like different connectors for the post interface, the A4 has a two millimeter pin header, which oh. actually has two extra pins on it for the oh. so you can connect to the data and clock line for the BMU microcontroller. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I'm trying one, to find the one, a mating. It's the one was... Acorn machine I do not have as an A4. I, I saw one on eBay and passed on it. I figure I have enough don't, projects. Don't but... do it. <laughs> speaking, the rabbit of hole. Has, <laughs> speaking as someone who has two of them, um, I would not recommend them. They need a lot of work to get them working. Oh, come on, Phil. Phil, you've reached a pinnacle with a functional A5000. <laughs> yeah, I, I have an A5000. So I bought this wrist PC thinking the wrist PC would be amazing, but actually it doesn't have any of the nostalgia of my childhood. It's an A5000. No. It's like the computer I had when I was 12, except, you know, four times as fast. But, um, but the wrist PC just sort of feels like a different machine. It's, it's really, really interesting wrist, looking at the kind of... It's a bit of a sort of like dying gasp out of Acorn. Yeah. yeah. It was... It, it's all right. I, it, it sort of does stuff does it faster um just but and you could plug a faster processor into it and you could plug a pc processor into it but it wasn't I have quite, that. <laughs> wasn't quite a pc and it wasn't quite what you really wanted out of a, a faster arm based machine i um, sure call it a dying gasp i i think it's hybrid is more i'd call it for the reasons you just said it yeah it doesn't know if it's a pc and it doesn't know <laughs> if it's an arm but but it but it but it was a dead end wasn't it you couldn't really bring it on anywhere else because you broke all sorts of things didn't you as soon as you tried to make it actually better it was <laughs> Certainly, it filled a niche in the education market because one of the schools Did I it, went to had a full. It was the upgrade for the, you know, for the risk machines that were already there, and sort of the ninety four, ninety six new deployments were all risk PCs. Mm. So there were quite a few out there. So, I, so the school I went to had a, a, you know, a computer lab full of them, on yeah. Ethernet rather than Econet. I mean, I. I um, I like it for it being the, the kind of top end. I, I, so I experienced them. I only experienced them when I actually went back and did teacher training. Right. And then I got, um, I, I, did te I did science teaching and I got caught with one trying to use it for data logging in a science lesson. And it was God awful, honestly. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is that all the software felt like it had been built by amateurs and you were getting used to software which felt like it had been built by software engineers as opposed to someone in their, on their own in their back room. And, and it just felt like a step backwards. 
every time you used one. And this was in 1998, 97, mm. 98, it would have been. Um, you know, and all right, DOS wasn't all that. Windows 3.1 wasn't all that. But, but the actual underlying hardware had a different trajectory. And the problem was, where was the Acorn stuff going? Certainly they were kicking the PCs into touch with multimedia, at least time to time. <laughs> yeah. Replay was pretty spectacular um, when that came out. I remember watching the, the Space Shuttle video quite a few times. It's um, true, but where were the APIs for actually using any of the multimedia stuff? Oh, well, Replay certainly had an API that could be used in other applications, and there was an application note on using it. There were example code passed to registered developers that's come out uh, recently through, uh, I think it's actually on Forkhorn. Um, yeah, that's my site. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm basically uh, going to say is that the, the, the registered developer stuff wasn't a, a useful program unless you had 200 quid a year to check away. Mm, yeah. I think that's the problem with the media stuff. They could have made it big if they'd just given it away. Mm. Rather than trying to make it something, and not only that, you needed you need quite expensive hardware to do any encoding. But um, yeah, you, you, there you wasn't any, there wasn't a lot of encoding software about and stuff. So making videos was right pain in the neck. Well, the encoding, a uh, uh, colleague of mine at work actually now was picked. a fully Sorry. paid, you know, quite expensive bit of software that you know to actually encode them, and then you needed hardware as well. Generally, it wasn't great. The encoding stuff, a colleague of mine at work picked up an x -Acorn, uh SGI machine and it had the replay encoder on it. So what was being used was an SGI machine to capture it, to capture the video and then encode it on, on a, another really stupidly expensive RISC workstation, so their, their MIP space. Um, and apparently... I don't know how true this is, but she reckoned that uh, the equipment U Unique Way had prior to AR Encode coming out for the RISC PC when the strong arm turned up was likely to be the same setup, uh, an SGI with a video input card and um, the replay encoder. That that needs dumping if that's not been dumped already. I don't think she still has the machine. Um, same person, same person I talked about this morning that um, has got some X Acorn via pace risk PC shoved in the loft, and I'm kind of gently pushing her towards going up in the loft and figuring out what she's got. That that doesn't need gentle pushing. That just needs a a, a ladder <laughs> and a broom. <laughs> That's, yeah, I, it's that. I mean, I have the thing to work is, work with thing her at work, and I don't want to harm that relationship because no, it's that's career fun. damaging. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. It was, <laughs> it was beautifully simple to implement, though, because I was involved with with a friend, and it, we implemented it on a little, on a really small FPGA back in the nineties. This was um, to do replay decode, um, and just take a one or two megabit stream. And generate mm. video. Mm. I've I got the documents from Sophie Wilson, and I've stuck them on GitHub as you do. So there yep. is my abortive effort at a replay decoder sat there, um, which I yeah, the, the moving lines and moving blocks codecs are fairly simple at bitstream level. I think someone else is working on them too. I have to dig the email out. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the subject if I say slightly. Phil, one of the things you mentioned was Econet. What were you thinking of doing with it? Well, uh, so I have, now I have a bunch of Econet capable <coughs> machines. I wonder if I have the board right here, actually. Okay, it's going to be too much trouble to find. But um, so, uh, something I started on a couple of years ago was a, um, a USB Ethernet adapter. Now there is, this is a duplicate of a, this is a duplicate project. Uh, someone else on Stardot has made a, 
Yeah, that's uh, Jay USB. Jason. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, but it, uh, that's a, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just, you know, steal that project like I did with the Phil's post box and I could and, and, and finish it, but, uh, because it's not all open source, but so I, um, started on my own one instead. Uh, and so it was also the kind of in the sort of indecisive, uh, Kind of, I was feeling a bit indecisive at the time. I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted to make a USB Ethernet adapter or a recreation of the uh, original Acorn one using modern components. Um, but I got it to the so the, the board has an Ethernet socket, uh, the an eco, a line driver suitable for, for Ethernet, the uh, collision detect circuitry, uh, microcontroller, and a CPLD, and then also it's got the pinout so that you can plug it into a master or a plate. Archimedes. Um, and I got it to the point where uh, you could, I could plug it in back to back to an A3000. And uh, when the A3000 sent something, I could dump it out over the USB serial port. Um, I don't think I ever got it to reply to the A3000, but it's, you know, it's got, it's that far. Um, so, uh, I sketched out, okay, I probably do have this right here, one second. Sketch this out the other day, where it's basically the post box hardware, except um, with a different buffer, two mm -hmm. buffers, uh, a 74 LVC 16245 and an LVC125, and that would be enough to basically use the, the postbox hardware as an Ethernet module, except now you have an FPGA, uh, which means it could probably actually be both an Ethernet uh, module to let an Acorn machine get on an Ethernet and also a USB adapter. Um, instead of, I, 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 I'm often tempted in my, in my projects to do the PCB before I've actually proven that, you know, what I'm trying to do will actually fit in the in the FPGA. This mm. time I'm gonna do the Verilog first. <laughs> I mean, what would, I mean, and, and, and this is why, why the USB Ethernet is always kind of fun as an idea, is you suddenly reach the stage where if you can hook it, everyone up to a PC, you can Ethernet your PC in, you can have a wide area Ethernet, which has a server, running somewhere on the web which everyone can who has acorn hardware can log into oh that would be really you could do that with gateway and AUN. you could but that requires you to have an archimedes running gateway with AUN. Yeah. but if you have hardware which you can hook your pc pc up and it acts as the gateway Mm. All of a sudden, you have a wide area Ethernet across the thing. And the other thing is that you'll find that the emulators should be able to use it and connect to it. So, so that was something else. I, so that's something that else I started on. The project. <laughs> I have half-baked code to support Ethernet and Arculator. Uh, I think it gets as far as uh, implementing enough of the... Six, uh, the I can't remember the um, the chip, the chip yeah, name, six, but the eight, uh, ADLC. Six, eight, the ADLC, yeah, the six eight B five four. Six eight B four five five four five four. four. Yeah, five four. I always think four five, but it's like a video adapter. Got a video, yeah. video yeah. chip, but yeah. So the um, it implements enough of the registers to make Arculator think there's an Ethernet module, and so it will boot up, give you the error about the station number not set, and so, then have Ethernet, but then not actually. So the where I got stuck was basically. So the, the Ethernet has this thing called the four-way handshake where station A wants to talk to station B. And so the first thing it does is, is say, station B, are you there? Station B responds, yes, I'm here and I'm listening to you. And then station A sends the message to it. Now, the problem is AUN doesn't do that. It dispenses with the first two bits of the four-way handshake. It just sends something out and then you get a mm. response or not, which is, which is, you know, recognizing the modern world because that's kind of how Ethernet works. But, uh, sorry, Ethernet works, but... In Ethernet, there's this expectation that you can tell if the station's alive and has, is, is waiting for you to talk to it first. 
And I remember kind of pondering that for a little while and then, you know, not having a good answer for what to do about the start of the, uh, the four-way handshake. Uh, but, you know, if there's a well-defined way to, to map Econet to AUN, then... Um, well, I mean, uh, the Gateway does that. I don't know how well that works. I mean, the, the, one of the people that I'd actually probably recommend thinking it out with is Jonathan Harston. Yes, yes, I bet he's done a lot of thinking about because that. Because he, he, I mean, you may disagree with him and you may take a, an amount of time to reach an accommodation with each other, but, um, you know, it, <laughs> but he understands it really, really, really deeply um, and sort of knows how the entire, all of the protocol works. He just has it. That's a really good point because um, it's like this, we know this has been done before. We know that there is an Econet Ethernet bridge, uh, Econet AUN bridge, but yeah, I just don't know what. He will does. probably sit there and go, it's really simple. All you need to do is. Great. Uh, I've actually, I mean, the other way to do it would be to emulate, rather than emulating gateway, emulate uh, an Econet bridge yeah. over the internet. And that would be I'm, the tidy way of doing it. I'm sat here looking at a disassembly that uh, someone on Stardot gave me. I can't remember the name without checking, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names. This is a thing. Um, but there's a disassembly, a very good one, of the bridge firmware. Uh, and it's not very long. It's a, a few K of six eight, uh, 6502 sorry, code. Uh, so mm -hmm. the behavior of the bridge is understandable. Um, it would have to be, the reverse engineering would have to be finished, but the hardware details are there and, you know, it's reasonable you, to assume that you could emulate yeah. the bridge. And you can access a, a, a server across the bridge. Yeah, and the BBC Micro would be able to deal with it, provided it has a new enough NFS ROM. Cool. Whereas Gateway doesn't work with BBC Micros. No, it doesn't. But that's what you want. You want all of the machines to be able to chat to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with modern language. I was going to say, would Econet actually, would emulating the bridge actually allow each, effectively, household to have their own range? Uh, be up to, what is it, 127 yeah. network numbers? You can, have a, you can have 100, yeah, you can have 127 on each, and then you can have 255 networks. Is that uh, right? 200. Oh, hell. 254. 254. 254 networks, 127 stations per network. Could you isn't it? do the equivalent of um, local nets, reserve one for local use inside your house, and then have the others on the public network? What, network zero? <laughs> exactly, yeah, something, you know, 10.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0 or, you know. It already has zero, which is um, uh, machines on this segment. So the bridge would. Yeah, you, you have an hour network and a their network and yeah, yeah. links and goes along there. Just in case you actually have more than 250 people interested in ever running this. <laughs> yeah, well, you could have networks linked to networks with multiple bridges and you get in this situation where to get to network 14, you have to go network 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 across the internet and they're all linked in a... <laughs> Phil, are you horrific. too young to remember FidoNet? You could only oh, go over I am. The, I never used it. There was a limit to how many bridges you could go over. <laughs> oh, I used FidoNet. When I was. A, I had a FidoNet point. Uh, I think I was Were you in, thirteen years old at the time. Yeah. So yeah, I think FidoNet was pretty much done for by the time I went to university. Um, it's but, yeah. it still gasps, I believe, on somewhere. But 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 the principle's the same, it's just a lot faster. Um Are there any, there was a limit on the number of projects uh, mm -hmm. for the BBC? Any ESP thirty two network projects for the BBC? Maybe like using uh, Econet through the ESP thirty two or the um, ESP eighty uh, two sixty six. So I, cool. I I did a Wi Fi modem adapter which I put the put the die grams up and some random crap code up for um which uses the 8266 
the 32 is is similar but it was it was just running off serial um i don't think anyone's bothered with it for ethernet but it it comes back to the same problem is how do you move ethernet effectively across ethernet basically or equivalent um and what and what's the best way of doing that embed it in a in another kind of um protocol Mm. but it's neat it, it's doing that neatly um so actually bbem i think if you run it on a network we'll chat ethernet across a network to other bbem instances on that network yes i believe it has its own kind of mapping uh yeah, it doesn't use AUN. Ultra is now barbecuing. Else. That's. <laughs> do, do we read um, its own kind of mapping as some kind of routing table? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, do you mean when you said um, some kind of mapping? Did you mean like a routing table? Oh, I mean uh, in that. So it's like Acorn, the uh, like risk, risk PCs. Talking over, talking to each other over Ethernet, and use this thing called AUN, which is it's it's kind of an encoding of the Ethernet protocol, but on top of using UDP. Um, uh, so that's kind of you know the, the official way to to do Ethernet over over an Ethernet uh, or over the internet even. Um, but BBM does something different. It doesn't use AUN, I believe. So a way of doing it, yeah. I couldn't tell you what it is. It's this was a year or more ago. It's yeah, I looked at it a few weeks ago. It's some custom thing. Um, the thing that sticks in my mind is that Econet has a fairly large maximum packet size, and a little part of my brain is going twenty k. And it's, I think it's pretty much unlimited. Just it, and practically by the amount of memory available in it. Like basically the largest file that you can successfully load on a BBC. I don't know. I, that, I guess that's I guess not I strictly true. That's not strictly right. true because there's a seven four LS one two three or one three two timer on the Ethernet adapter. Oh, Half yeah. of that chip is used as a uh, babble timer. So if you hang the bus in transmit and send a ton of data, it will cut off after a while. It's in the one of the service manuals on Chris's acorns explains how this works, and there's an Econet thread on. Oh, that's a, explaining it's it. It's in the beautifully ludicrous way of limiting things. It's, it's in the A500 well, service manual. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this this actually has caught acorn out because so it just goes. Shut Econet. up now. <laughs> <laughs> You've had enough time. Okay. There's also the limit of the, um, the the bridge has only got an 8k buffer in it, and I think it has to yeah. buffer everything through that. So I think you also get hit by that. Yeah, and then you've got this other fun thing of Acorn getting caught out by their own clever design with the Risk PC Ethernet adapter, as we found out when I fixed mine. <laughs> so that was they stuck a HCT132 on there, which has a different timing calculation, doesn't reset the same way. So Apart the risk PC Ethernet adapter without modifications cannot act as a server and is a bit glitchy as a client. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> I like that we're discovering all these things 30 years later. Yeah, like... yeah. <laughs> I we're mean, solving I... problems that don't need to be solved. <laughs> <laughs> well, they need to be solved for us. I mean, the, the one I'm looking at is the cost of Ethernet adapters is going up. I can still get the 68B54 chips from China for very cheap. Um, but the they line actually work? Are going uh, I haven't tried one yet. I haven't got a, a socket I can sort push one into. Um, uh, but they seem legit. I was going to say, you want to try buying a network bridge? <laughs> Uh, maybe later. Well, I, might I mean, we've got enough first. designs for modules knocking around that you yeah. can try them out. Or you can plug yeah, one well, into a beeb. 
That's what I was thinking of uh, putting together a Econet module and plugging it into the A4000 and see if they work. But I'm actually nicking uh, uh, Myelin's design there, Phil, um, a little bit because I've bought the same line driver he's using. And Yeah, it works. And, I mean, it seems to at least. <laughs> well, there's not a lot that can go wrong in an RS485 line driver. Uh, you only need to transmit and if you use the LM311 you've got collision detection and data receive as Acorn did it. I remember the spending always... some time trying to make sure that the output impedance was the same as the ones that were used in the original Econet modules because mm -hmm. I think originally I remember I think there was some other chip which basically had a, it was, you know, it was effectively like a CMOS driver or something where it pulled up and down very, very sharply. Whereas the, um, I think the, the Econet one, it'll pull down quite well, but pulling up, it's, it's got something like nine ohms of resistance in the, in the uh, mm. upper transistor. And, and so that's how uh, collision detect. That's how, that's how you don't have Ethernet modules frying themselves when they collide um, uh, because, because of that. So when two Ethernet modules uh, try, to, try to drive the bus in opposite directions, it goes low. Um, but if you, yeah, if you put the wrong modern driver on it, you'll just find one of them goes up in smoke instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, what was it, the, um, it detects uh, the difference in voltage across the two differential lines, isn't it? That's right. I've, I've been I've been batting around an idea to like for the FPGA version of this. I was thinking that you should be able to detect a collision just by observing the value on the line. And if you're driving it, and the value on the line is not the one that you're driving it to, then obviously there's a collision. Mm. And I think that would be sufficient. Um, I bet there's all sorts of weird reflections and stuff inside the Econet line when you have a bunch of machines on it. But uh, if you're just, just reading it on the clock edge, it's probably okay, I think. Bus impedance would be the one that I'd think of first. Um, but that's only going to be a factor if you're using very thin wire or a very long network up towards the where you've got a collision on a 500 meter mm -hmm. network right at the top end of the limits and the collisions are between two machines on either end. Yeah. <laughs> because it will look to your near end like you've managed to drive it, but 30 ohms later, it looks to the other <laughs> one like it's driving it. Yeah. Well, I wonder if that would confuse, I mean, this, this is one of those things where we'd have to, uh, we'd have to implement it and then have a shootout between the, uh, the old and the new and see, uh, <laughs> See whether they um, see whether they're because the the old system basically looks for um, the differential lines being too close together, mm. and so with this case, it that might also fail. So I don't know. I mean, <laughs> well, I guess it depends works. because they're if they're both driving opposites, they will probably end up about the same. But, yeah. yeah, because this trick works with um, OBD. But, uh, what's the the underlying bus for that? The the Bosch one. Um, oh, can? Can, yeah. Um, the, it works by, it'll send, what is it? it sends the address as a, a true and a complement um, and assumes that if something else is transmitting, the true will mismatch against the complement or something along those lines. And it's designed so that um, there is a dominant and a recessive state on the bus. So the <laughs> dominant state will will always put it will pull low in preference to pulling high <laughs> so it's this kind of collision detection trick um but defined a little bit more formally sounds like a lab needs to be set up Indeed. <laughs> 300 meter drum of cable see uh, hook uh, an ethernet uh, ethernet plug on either end sure we can get enough cat six to do it or cat five But uh, yeah, I I wanted to do a, an Econet module with that line driver, and I want to at some point hook um, maybe an STM32 up to an Econet because I've noticed certainly with the Risk PC uh, stuff that Netmon can't see a situation where the where a a, a, a transmitting machine 
has had its transmission cut off by the babble timer. So there's, there's some little network uh, debugging things I'd quite like to play around with. Mm. This is after doing a, a mini podual Ethernet adapter based on Theo Marquetos's uh, A4 Ethernet, uh, Ethernet adapter. I have had too many projects. We've, we've, yeah. <laughs> don't What's the availability of Ethernet adapters? So Ethernet for the RISC PC is still relatively available. There was never one officially for the A4. There was an Ethernet adapter, and that's what yeah. the trap door was for. Um, oh, there was the parallel port version for the A4, wasn't there? I was just about to mention that. Yeah, Atom Wide's parallel one. Mm. But what Theo did was, um, I'll just move my A4000 board out of the way. He took a Cirrus Logic uh, CS8900 um, Ethernet controller, stuck it on a board, and took a, took the board out of an Ethernet adapter and replaced it with the CS8900A board. Um, and all the mechanical details are in the A4 tech ref. It's true. I should probably mention that he never got as far as actually running it because he did blow up his A4 accidentally whilst doing this. Right, okay. <laughs> so so I, I wouldn't guarantee it's a finished project. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, just works it out seems like he's had it from the website. It looks like he's had it pinging. And then it so, <laughs> Well, I have... Oh, let me just disconnect this. I have the the beaten up, damaged, wrecked A4 that I don't really give a damn about here. This is the one that's been resurrected and I think is probably on borrowed time anyway. So I'm quite happy to use I mean, that one to find developing out. Developing for the A4 is pretty niche, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even when Theo was doing it, it was pretty niche. There weren't a lot of them. The, um, so that around the turn of the century, there weren't many working still. Quick question, guys. I've got Spro's um, Ethernet in my master. You know, the plugging board that goes in the Ethernet socket. Can they actually be plugged into the Archimedes? Are they interchangeable? No one's written any software for the Archimedes to run the thing. Try a DCI 4 driver, wouldn't you? Hmm. I, I can't, you know, it would be whatever whatever address lines it and data lines it's wiggling. Well, it's wiggling the data lines, but it's whichever address it's responding to. It's going to be responding to the Econet address because that's uh, decoded. But it's not, it's not open. So you, you would have mm. to get Spro to tell you how to talk to it. Didn't, didn't Rob C have a um, Ethernet module? working for the Archimedes, he just said it was a bit slow and never developed it further. Possibly. Run I mean, the thing on the BBC, em, uh, BBC emulator on the Arc. Mm. I'm just think. oh. I mean, there's a, there, there's a myriad of sort of like Ethernet in a chip things that you could just bodge onto the podule bus. The difficulty is most of them are SPI interface, at least the ones I found. The yeah, 89 but what day. about that one that they keep using with the Apple II? I'd have to look that one up. I'm not sure which Oh, what is. is it? They use it in this thing called Ethernet, and he charges a bomb for it, but it's not that complicated. Um, What does it use? It's some like sort of monolithic chip. Uh, There's a couple with one of the WizNet chips. So it's quite it's popular a WizNet. with the Arduino folks. Okay. Yeah, it's a WizNet chip. And so that's not SPI. I think that, that mu if they're using it with an Apple II, it must run on a, you know, a, a sensible bus of some description. I say sensible. Well, SPI is sensible, but the reason I discounted it was because I'd need an FPGA or a CPLD mm -hmm. and do everything over SPI. It would be quite slow. 
the WISNAT chip, I think I discounted that because it implements too much of TCP IP on the chip. Mm. Um, whereas I was looking for something that would was more like a traditional controller where you just give it an Ethernet frame and say, send that, or it receives one and it says, you know, toggle the IRQ, it's in slot one, read it out. So it, there is it, another chip, the ENC28J60. Have a look at that. That's so the SPI really, one. Oh, that's also SPI. Okay. Uh, I actually have to get going. Uh, so spent some, some time, some of the summer Saturday afternoon with my family. Uh, it's, it's been lovely talking to you all. Oh, lovely Thank talking you. to you. Thank you. Bye. See you then.